All right, so we've been talking the last few times about JavaScript, and we'll continue that today. Uh, the idea of JavaScript is, is the third language that is typically involved in any kind of web development. HTML is used to to uh, describe the content of the page. So what do you have on the page? You have lists, you have links, you have paragraphs, and so on. That's what HTML is responsible for. Um, CSS is responsible for the appearance of the page. And then finally, you have JavaScript that is responsible for interactivity of the page. So anything that happens within the page after the page is initially loaded, any changes made to the appearance or even the content of the page is going to be because of JavaScript. All right? So you can pretty well count on that. Because the server's responsibility is in creating the initial page. It takes the information from the request, whether it be data from the form, other sorts of data about the request. It processes that, and it produces a page, and it delivers it to the client. Once it's on the client side, then, the JavaScript takes over and does any of the interactivity, whereas if the user does something, something responds. So what I want to do today is I want to do an example. Uh, I want to spend a minute looking at the examples we did last time. And then I want to do an example of image swap overs, uh, image, image swaps when you do a mouse over. So let's find the example from last time. That's not it. Okay. We, our last example that we went over <coughs> was this one, which is kind of goofy, but it's meant to show you that anything about the page that we want to, we can change. So for example here, we have a button that switches the text between big text and normal text. This example follows sort of the basic mold of JavaScript. This actually includes the menu as well, which I didn't realize at first. So when you click on the menu, it shows it. When you click on it again, it hides it. So let's look at those two pieces of functionality and review how they're accomplished. Let's first of all look at the buttons. These buttons have an on-click event associated with them. And the on-click event is part of the actual HTML tag. It's an attribute. And on-click describes what piece of code that you want to run when the button is clicked. Notice the type of this is a button and not a submit button. That's important. Because a submit button is going to try and send the data to the server. 
Um, in this case, we don't want to send any data to the server. We just want to initiate some JavaScript. So we use a plain old button instead of a submit button. The onClick attribute describes what we want to do when we click on the button. So for example, we want to isolate just on this instruction. On click equals. So when the user on clicks, they're going to execute this little snippet of JavaScript. Notice how JavaScript is enclosed in quotes. All right? There's a starting quote and an ending quote. And notice that we're using double quotes to indicate the start and end of the JavaScript statement. You actually could use single quotes to do that. But notice that the quotes inside the JavaScript statement are different than the quotes outside the JavaScript statement. So in this case, because we're using double quotes outside the JavaScript statement to delineate where the JavaScript statement begins and ends, we're going to use single quotes inside the JavaScript statement. If we use single uh, quotes on the outside, then we'd use double quotes within. That's, again, we have two sets of quotes, and that's how we use the two sets of quotes. If we were to use double quotes inside here, like this, the browser would think that that is the end of the JavaScript statement. And because that's not a complete JavaScript statement, it would give you an error. So, so many of the th examples we're going to look at, and so much of JavaScript has this statement in it, document get element by ID. What that is doing is that's finding the thing on the page, the element, the part of the page, that has this as the ID. Because it's included in quotes, it's literally that. It's not a variable or anything. It's the word main. So we're going to find the thing on the page that has an ID of main. And that is this section right here. So our code is just pointed at that section. And we're going to change something about it. What are we going to change something about it? We're going to change the style. OK? What about the style? We're going to change the font size. And we're going to change it to 2M. And again, literally that. That's called a literal. So that's not a variable. We're going to change that value to 2M, which means twice as big as normal. All right? Now notice in CSS, if you were setting the font size, you'd use font-size. In JavaScript, that converts to font-size with size having a, couple, uh, a capital S. So we don't use the dashes. We instead use a capital S for each subsequent word in something. So what this says is, document on the web page. Find the thing that has an ID of main. We're going to change its style, specifically its font size, and we're going to change it to 2M. And we're going to do that when the user clicks on this button. All right? So that's kind of the anatomy of that JavaScript statement. And all our JavaScript examples so far have looked a lot like this. We have then the small button that says, well, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to make the, the font size 1 EM. So we're changing the value of the font size to 1 EM. So when we run it and click it, it makes it bigger or smaller. Now, in this case, the menu, we use what's called a function. And we use a function because we have so many of these submenus that we want to treat the same. The only difference is the specific submenu that we make bigger or smaller. So for example, in this case, we have an on-click event on this li that says, find the thing that has the submenu 1. We're going to pass that submenu 1 to this function called toggle menu. 
Now, toggle menu is not a command in JavaScript. Toggle menu is a function that we created. And it appears within a script tag defined as a function. Function toggle menu. We have in parentheses an arg. An arg means an argument. That's a placeholder for whatever we call that function, whatever value we're going to give it when we run that function. Up here, we're defining the function. We're saying what that statement toggle menu is going to do. Here, we're calling the function. OK, now we want to toggle menu with submenu1. So it's going to take submenu1 and place it in the value variable. And since arg is a variable, we're not going to use quotes around it. All right, so this function is simple. We check to see if it is currently being displayed. If it's displayed, we hide it. So if the display value for this element is block, in other words, we can see it, we're going to hide it. Otherwise, we're going to show it. So we're going to turn it off. If it's being shown, we're going to turn it on if it's not being shown. So every time we click on it, it's not being shown. We click on it, we show it. Click on it again, we hide it. Likewise with this. And again, the advantage of this is if we had more things to do, all we'd have to do is call that function again with submenu 3, submenu 4, submenu 5, and we wouldn't have duplicate code. Because we're just calling this function, and that function is taking whatever value we're giving it, and it's doing something to that submenu. The other example we had was similar, except it used the on mouse over, and it did not use a function. So we put our mouse on it, take our mouse off, mouse on it, mouse off, mouse on it, and so on down the line. If we look at that, it looks a lot like the other thing, except we have a mouse over and a mouse out instead of toggling it. And when we put our mouse over it, we show the submenu. When we take our mouse out of it, we hide the submenu. And I also, just for the fun of it, I change the color of it too. Only reason I change the color is just to show you that anything about the page we can change. All right. Once we point to an element on that page, we can set any HTML property of it we can set any CSS property of it. So anything that we've defined in the original HTML doc document, we can overrule, all right? And we can put a different value in. All right, let's go on to a image swap program. So I think I had one already. At least I have the images. So let me look. Okay. Actually, I think I do this two different ways. <coughs> All right. What I have is I have three images, and I have two versions of each image. I have a thumbnail, and I have 
a full size image. So one, image one, if you notice, you can read that the dimensions of it are, oh, forgot to pull that down. The dimensions of that image are 800 by 619. All right. 1T is 200 by 155. So it's a smaller version. Generally, that's what we mean when we say we have a thumbnail, is that we have a smaller version of the image. Now, it's not always simply a shrunken image. We can make a thumbnail by cropping out a small portion of the image. That's especially useful if you are, uh, if you want to keep all the thumbnails looking the same, have the same dimensions and the same aspect ratio. When I say aspect ratio, I mean the ratio between the height and width of an image. All right. Same thing here. It's the same thing here. So when I open this up, I have my image and I have my thumbnail. And again, when I mouse over, the image changes to be the image that I want to see. This is effective, again, uh, in, in terms of making the most, of, you know, making the most of a small screen size. All right. Um, we could actually even make these thumbnails smaller if we wanted to. All right, because those thumbnails are still pretty big. But we could make the thumbnails smaller and have a whole bunch of thumbnails over here on the side. And as the user places the mouse on top of the thumbnail, they can see an example of the larger picture. All right. All right, so let's see how we do that. Again, remember, we have two images, two versions of each image, a smaller and a larger. So in this case, for simplicity, I put the CSS file in the same file. So I have a section with an ID of thumbnails that I make the width of 25% and the image I make 100% of that. And the images are contained in a list and I have no bullet points for that list. The big picture, I make a width of 60% I float it to the left, I give it a margin of 15 pixels, and I make the big image have a width of 100%. So, for each thumbnail, I say on mouse over, document get element by ID, big. What does that do? That finds the thing on the page that has an ID of big. That's that image. What do I change about it? I change the .src. Now notice how that's different than the earlier examples we had. In all the earlier examples we had, we said document get element by ID dot style dot something. We did that when we were showing and hiding the uh, menus, and we did that when we were changing uh, the font size and changing the color and so on. That's because we were changing something about the appearance of it, something about the style. Here, 
I just say dot SRC, which means that we're changing not something about the style, but we're actually changing an HTML attribute. All right? So it's not a coincidence that this matches this. We're pointing to the same thing. This is the image as it will initially get loaded. Here we're pointing to that image tag and we're changing the value of the SRC attribute to either 1, 2, or 3. Okay? So in this case, we're not changing something about the style, we're changing an HTML attribute. Questions about this? Now, the one thing I will say I should do in this example is I should give a maximum width. Because these are all, the thumbnails are all 200 wide, except for this one. And the big images are all 800 wide, except for this one. You never want an image to go bigger than the size. So I say with 60%, I want to make sure it doesn't get bigger than the maximum size of the image. So here I'm going to say max width. Uh, I think I said the biggest one was, or the smallest one was 130 so pixels. So I'll say max width. 130 pixels, and my big picture image max width, I think I said it was 500 and some, so I'll put 500 in there. makes them a little smaller. The reason for that is you never want to resize a, a, an image bigger than how many pixel, pixels are actually in it. Because if you do that, you're going to get distortion. So if you're going to say the width of this to be 100%, that's good. That's fine and good. But you want to put a maximum width on it just in case it gets too big. It doesn't size itself bigger than the image actually is. If you size an image bigger than it actually is, then you're going to get distortion. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take this image. I'll put this image on the page. And I'll say image with 100%. Now this image is only 200 pixels wide, I think. But if I make it 100%, it's going to make it the entire width of the, of the page because it's not included in any section or anything. Now, I don't know if it is easy for you to see, but that image is very much distorted. It's pixelated. All right? 
you can especially see it like maybe through here, maybe through here, and so on. But it's definitely not as sharp as the same image at the proper dimensions, right? So the bottom line is you can't make an image, you can't resize an image to be bigger than however many pixels are in it. So if you use a width of a percentage, be sure to put a maximum width in there so it doesn't get any bigger than how big the image actually is because that will cause distortion. So I went and did that in these two examples. Questions about any of this? I have another version of this too. Kind of curious what it does. I don't remember. Ah. Only difference is in there, instead of the on mouse over, you do an on, on mouse click. So it's going to look essentially identical. Ah. Actually, there's a couple things different here. Number one, I included an access key here. And number two, I made it based on the on click. And number three, it calls a function. All right. So what does the access key do? If I use alt, one, two, or three, I can switch to it that way, hand not touching the mouse. All right. That's very useful uh, for accessibility because some people with certain uh, neurological conditions or certain uh, uh, issues with mobility for whatever reason, carpal tunnel syndrome or whatever, find it easier using the keyboard to navigate rather than the mouse. In fact, a lot of people that are really heavy computer users use the keyboard like almost all the time to do things. You know, they don't use the mouse menus, they always use the keyboard shortcuts and so on. So. That has really nothing to do with JavaScript, but that's just a good reminder of accessibility. Uh, I should probably put a message about that on the screen, by the way, to inform the person, because otherwise they wouldn't know, you know that you can touch one, two, or three and change the image. So that's one thing I wanted to show with this. And you do that simply by saying access key one, access key two, access key three. All right, second thing I did is my, I changed that to an on click instead of on mouse over. That's pretty straightforward. But the other thing I did was I used a function. And I used a function mainly because I don't want to, I, I want to change both the image and the alt text. So if someone's accessing this page with a screen reader, not only do I want to change the actual image, but I want to change the alt text of the image. So I have a function called change image. That function gets placed in a script tag in the head section. I have the word function, the name of the function, change image. It has to match including case. I have two arguments. That is, any time I call this function, I'm going to give it two values. I'm going to give it the name of the image that I want to show and the alt text for, the new alt text for that image. And then, I'm going to set that image that has an ID of big I'm going to set its source to whatever argument I passed in here. 
and I'm going to set the alt attribute to whatever value I've given image alt. So for example, when I click on the first one, I call change image, and I pass the value 1.jpg, and I pass the text picture of lion. So that's going to plug in 1.jpg into image source, picture of lion into image alt, and then the function is going to work. We're going to find the thing on the page that has an ID of big, and we're going to change this SRC element to image source. All right. We're then going to go and we're going to point to uh, the same image and change the alt text to whatever value I put in there. So all I have to do then is, now that I've defined this function that takes two arguments, changes the image, changes the alt attribute, is give that, all right, and call that function, give the two values, and it will take the first value, make the image that image, take the second value, make the old attribute. Now the nice thing about this is even if I had 50 thumbnails, I would do just the exact same thing. I wouldn't have to repeat these lines of code. I would just repeat the thumbnail with the particular change image method. Questions about this? You think we can zoom in on an image? All right. Let's look. Remember on eBay, I've seen this. We look for something. All right, there's an image swap. Uh, that opens up the bigger image in a window. I have seen, I'm almost sure it was on eBay. Maybe they've changed it or maybe, or if you put your mouse on, on this image, it will zoom in. All right. See if we can find JavaScript to do that. All right. We can find this. Over here. And that's exactly how that works. This is actually fairly simple JavaScript. How do you think this works? Let's, let's see if we can think about this. How do you think the zoom image works? Well, We have two images, all right? We have the small image and we have the big image, first of all. Let's break this down into HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML-wise, we have two images, all right? CSS, probably not a, C a lot of CSS going on here. One other thing in HTML that I forgot to mention, and here's where CSS comes into play, is this image, there's sort of a frame around it. So we don't see the entire image all at once. All right. In fact, I'm going to do something. I'm going to go 
and I'm going to save this page Now I'm going to edit that page. I saved it. Oh, there we go. I'm going to go into the HTML that it's saved, edit Notepad++, and I'm going to get rid of all the style sheets. So there's actually this, this, All right, I think I've gotten rid of all the CSS. Nope, more. Let's look at that page now. Oh, well, this didn't show what I thought it would. All right, never mind. Let's click on Try It Yourself. What we have is we have an image, and then we call an image zoom on the mouse over. And what that's going to do, go find, well, this is more complicated than I thought. But essentially, all this does is it takes a bigger image and changes the position so that you only see a portion of the bigger image. Yeah, this is more complicated than I thought it was. This is something, though that if you want to take the time to explore is really not all that hard. It's a little harder than I want to talk about here in class because it involves a lot of stuff. But if you want to dip your feet in JavaScript a little bit more, this is a good example to go over. Um, because essentially all it does is it takes and it grabs a portion of the image and shows it bigger over in this frame here. There's other ways to do it as well. This is a little more of what I was thinking originally.
there a place where I can run this? Finding the image is finding the width of the image. Now it's changing the value using the width property. So the zoom in finds the image, asks for the client width of it, adds 100 pixels to the client width, and then sets the width. And then the zoom out does the opposite, except it takes out the 100. So there's a couple ways to do this. I want to run it live, but I'm sure you could paste this. Oh, we can. Right. That's a little less involved than the one we saw in W3 schools, but also sort of does the trick as well. Any questions over any of this? Next week we're going to spend some time on JavaScript. We will also spend some time talking about your project and making sure any final preparations you have for getting that done is going well. Any questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.